technology that has potential to do a lot of that, back to that transparency idea, pushing this information out, but doing it in a way that respects privacy that makes it safe. If I can get it to go. There it goes. Yours worked, not mine. That was perfect, thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a nice lunch. Let's see, how are we doing on time? Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about the interagency effort that's been going on in the past year to integrate. Uh, good privacy practices into federal organizations. And um, Martha Landisberg is a co-chair with me on the Best Practices Subcommittee. It's under the Federal Privacy Committee. And uh, just recently came on board, so she's been great uh, stepping in to uh, take the seat of Toby Levin, who recently tired, retired. Uh, first about my sponsor, the FDIC. We're an independent agency that was created in 30 three, so I think we beat you by a year or so. But, uh, <laughs> so we've been all around a long time. Uh, but our mission is to promote uh, confidence and um, uh, trust in the nation's financial system, which obviously has been a challenging time the last few years. We do it through ensuring deposits, uh, overseeing financial institutions who are members of FDIC, and by uh, managing resolutions and receiverships, basically closing during the bank closing process. And all of that activity involves a significant amount of collection of bank customer data, as well as other types of sensitive PII, and of course we have internal HR data uh, needs as well. And our agency, I'm up here with two giant agencies, and we're the small agency in the team because I think even though we've tripled in size in the last couple of years because of the current crisis, um, we're still pretty small compared to my colleagues here. Our privacy program is based in the office of the CIO, and uh, who serves as our senior agency official for privacy and chief privacy officer, so he has a very full plate. Uh, we have a new CIO, Russ Pittman, so give him a call and say hello. Uh, and we report through uh, the CISO, uh, Chief Information Security Officer, to our CPO. So uh, we're very integrated in with our IT security team. We have ventured into Web 2.0, but it's in the push mode that Martha referenced. Uh, we take up information on our website and we push it out through other communication channels like Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube. You can see us on there. And uh, we actually have a partnership with Susie Orsman in order to promote education and awareness about how to make sure your deposits are insured because we're getting a lot of questions about that. As Jonathan mentioned, there is the Federal CIO Council Privacy Committee. And uh, the Best Practices Subcommittee is co-chaired by FDIC, DHS, and uh, Department of Energy. Uh, Jerry Hanley, our Chief Privacy Officer over there, is the current third co-chair. And we've been very focused on working with um, Scott Bernard of Federal Highway and Ron Ross of NIST and developing and integrating a privacy risk management framework into the Federal Enterprise Architecture Security and Privacy Profile. Uh, this is the goal of this is to build a unified framework for both privacy and security uh, throughout the federal organizations, and it can be government-wide or agency-wide or program-wide or system-wide. Um, but we really are focused on building that roadmap to get to good privacy practices. And version 3.0 is uh, is now going through CIO Council review. So some of you may have seen that out there. And the new privacy control families that I'm going to talk about are actually referenced in the new recent NIST publication. So turning to the control families, uh, they are based on the fair information practice principles that Martha referenced earlier in her presentation. And we call them FIPS, not to be confused with federal information processing standards. Uh, they happen to look a lot like if you've ever been to DHS. And I have to tell you, DHS Privacy Office has a wonderful, wonderful website. They are a leader in our space. And all of us go to that website to look at the latest and greatest policies and procedures coming out. Um, but these principles and control families, one and the same, uh, very closely aligned with the DHS ones because of their leadership in this area. Uh, again, they are intended to serve as a privacy risk management framework. We are just at the beginning of developing something similar to, the, to what you have in the security environment, where you have 
I guess a decade or so of publications developed by NIST that probably are as high as this podium uh, that really helps to give agencies guidance on how to bake security into their uh, federal activities. We're just at the very beginning of that, so we're starting first with a very high level uh, framework. And it's something that's intended to be used for whatever your activities are. We talk about it in terms of the enterprise architectures, but it really can be uh, applied to any activity, including your new social media activities. Before applying the control families, we ha recommend that you do a couple of things. Uh, first, you always have to look at the type of PII that you have in-house, uh, whether on an enter enterprise level, at the program level, system level. You, we are all under, uh, in the federal agency world, under a requirement to constantly identify um, our holdings of PII, and that's something you would want to do first. You'd want to understand your legal framework. Martha uh, and Jonathan both talked about the Privacy Act as well as eGov Act, but agencies also have additional requirements, um, may have additional statutory or directive or executive order requirements that they have to take into consideration. Uh, mapping the data flows. This is one of the most interesting things that you can do in an organization, and you can see my little rudimentary arrow thing that was <laughs> intended to try to just underscore the point. You have to understand what kind of data is coming in, where it's stopping along the way, and where it's going. And we all know that agencies are increasingly using uh, contract support, and it's getting more challenging to manage that, but it's critical to know where your data is coming and going. And then you have to, again, take into account your unique mission. And certainly law enforcement intelligence agencies have certain additional requirements, as well as possibly exemptions under some of the requirements of uh, the Privacy Act, for example, and you have to take that into account. And last but not least, the families are interrelated, the ones that I'm going to talk about, so that you will always constantly look at them. And if you do something in one area, you want to see what the impact is on the next. So turning to our control families, there are eight of them. And I don't know how many people here know about the FEA SPP version 2.0, but uh, within that document, there were about 17 or 18 suggested privacy control families. So the community came together the past year and decided to refine it around a set of uh, what are more common principles in the privacy community, the fair information practice principles. And we brought it down to eight, and we think that's a more manageable framework to work with, and uh, they are transparency, which is uh, all the things you've heard about here in terms of providing notice to the public, whether it's through privacy impact assessments, privacy act notices, uh, if you have a website, we all do in the government, you would have an online privacy policy. And that's basically where you would uh, disclose to the public what you are doing with any type of data that's being collected in terms of PII. Uh, individual participation and redress, another key principle in control family. Um, that's where you involve the individual in that collection process. Uh, privacy is about giving control to you and me and giving us as much opportunity to control what happens to that data. Uh, so to the extent where it's practically feasible, you want to get direct consent. Um, if you ever applied for a federal job, and a lot of us in this room have, you had to sign a lot of documents saying, yeah, it's okay for you to collect this data and go do background checks and so forth. Uh, but that's not always feasible. And so you get, uh, you give, get consent or get, I guess, what would be implied consent through publishing your notices. You also would need to provide certain mechanisms um, under the Privacy Act. We all have the right to um, access and amend our records, and you have to provide certain mechanisms to do that. And some people might think, well, what does that have to do with maybe an IT system? But an IT system may need to be designed to develop and tr or to track whatever uh, mechanisms or, or policies have been put in place through the notice. You have to be able to uphold that through the technology in terms of access to records. Uh, purpose specification. This is where you're trying to be clear in your notice uh, what your authorities are for collecting this data, whether it's a statute, a uh, executive order, um, some other type of internal directive, and again, the purposes for which the PII is going to be used. Uh, data minimization and retention. I think we all know that means don't keep data any longer than you